We are joined by the Palestinian model Qahir Harhash. One of the stories which recently made headlines within the context of the global intifada of unity for the anti-Palestinian and Islamophobic messages that you actually received from Zara's head of design. You published these messages to show the world what Palestinians go through when we simply tell our stories and share our experiences. Zara needs to correct this mistake, put out a statement where they apologize to Muslims, to Palestinians, Arabs, queer people. Because in her messages, she offended so many people. She sent you a message that was so long, I thought she was breaking up with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about the way that it could encourage Palestinians, make us feel that we have some sort of influence on this world. Because the Zionists have stronger influence. Why on earth would you see eye to eye with your colonizer? Very hard to see eye to eye when there is an illegal wall between you. Hello and welcome to episode 18 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where we break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine from all over the world and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of spreading awareness about the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gazan Girl, and I'm joined by my co-host Mikey B. What's up, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok, Michael Scherzer on Instagram. And Mikey Intifada, if you spent the last month advertising Pride in a place where gay marriage is illegal. Oh, I didn't realize it was illegal. <laughs> I guess the pink washing is also working on me because I totally thought it was legal in Israel. But anyway, uh, before we get into today's episode, like, comment, and subscribe if you hang out with us on YouTube. And if you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review if you can. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources on palestinepod.com. And if you want to get involved in the conversation, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. And feel free to give us a follow on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. On today's episode, we are joined by the Palestinian model Qahir Harhash. Qahir, welcome to the Palestine Pod. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you guys. It's a pleasure to also do this with people that are either Palestinian or advocates for Palestine, because at the end of the day, whatever is happening back home affects everyone. We're so happy to have you. One of the stories which recently made headlines within the context of the global intifada of unity for the anti-Palestinian and Islamophobic messages that you actually received from Zara's head of design. You published these messages to show the world what Palestinians go through when we simply tell our stories and share our experiences. If I'm not mistaken, she actually wrote to you in response to a video that you had posted on your Instagram where you were actually showing footage of Jerusalem and showing the disparities in access to water between the Israeli occupiers and the occupied Palestinians. Zara's head of design actually said, amongst other things, and her message, I mean, was horrible and very poorly written and obviously advanced several very common Zionist tropes, but some of the things that she had mentioned were that your post was unfair and lies, which, you know, is a bit strange because nothing you said was a lie. The way that Israel siphons Palestinian water and other resources, the distribution of resources, it's not an opinion. It's something that's widely documented. You can read um, reports about it published by NGOs from all over the world. But in fact, you don't even have to read reports because you can see the proof in front of your own eyes, which is Incidentally, what you were doing when you had made that post, you were showing with your camera the black water tanks that are on top of Palestinian homes and occupied Jerusalem and the Jewish Israeli communities that don't have those black water tanks on top of their homes because they're actually hooked up to the water system, whereas Palestinians oftentimes are not. She also accused Palestinians of being uneducated and quote unquote blowing up hospitals, other than the fact that Palestinians are highly educated people. The blowing up hospitals comment is a really delusional comment, especially in the context of this latest assault by Israel on Gaza, which destroyed so much of the Gazan healthcare infrastructure, like the offices of the international NGO Doctors Without Borders, like the offices of the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. They targeted doctors by striking their homes while they were sleeping, and two doctors who actually work at Al-Shifa Hospital were killed. The Israeli army also shelled the roads leading to El Shifa Hospital, 
preventing ambulances from being able to reach the hospital quickly. And of course, this is nothing new because Israel has previously bombed Palestinian hospitals before in Gaza during its previous assaults, including in 2014. They'll ever project your war crimes on someone? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, I, I essentially picked up our, her entire message and it was filled with projection of things that Israel does to Palestinians. It was completely false and it was blatantly anti-Palestinian and regurgitating so many Islamophobic tropes as well. She also, for example, remarked that, oh, Israel doesn't teach children to throw stones at soldiers, which is a super strange comment to make when the only soldiers in Palestine are Israeli soldiers. We don't have soldiers. It's actually true that they don't teach their kids to throw stones. They teach them to use automatic weapons. Exactly. I want to get your views about this message from Zara's head of design, then also the aftermath, including the follow-up messages from her, which got so frantic. I, I mean, I went through them and they were half apologies, fake apologies, not really apologies. And the response that came from her, but also the response that came from Zara officially. So if you could share with us what the aftermath was like, and then also what your views are. Nothing has happened from Zara. I posted what happened on Instagram just to basically tell people that if Zara needs to correct this mistake, then they should really put out a statement where they apologize to Muslims, to Palestinians, Arabs, queer people. Because like in her messages, she offended so many people. I got people from all over like the spectrum, you know, just sending messages about what Vanessa had said. But yeah, we got no reaction after... They, they contacted my agency when it first started and they were like, oh, we really like the way Kahit had handled it. Um, but they really didn't want to do anything else. You know, they would just want me to post the apology. And I thought to myself, like, no, I'm not going to post the apology because first of all, like, I've read it 20 times. It's obvious that it was a result of her being afraid of the repercussions from the situation that she started. I think they have a very bad PR team. The reality is she wrote on my comments and she sort of outed me to everyone that follows me. And for nine days, I was like, like, I was in shock, actually. I, I showed it to my agent and I said, look, on the 31st, she wrote this comment. And I was like, look, why is she saying these things? And then they were like, just ignore, you know, like, ignore whatever she's saying. And I, and I, and I. Also thought, hey, I don't want to be causing trouble in this industry at the moment because I'm, I don't think I'm uh, as established as I'd like to be at the moment. You know, I'm a new face and new faces as, as fast as they come in, uh, the faster they leave, you know, if wrong things happen. And yeah, it felt like I was put in a sensitive position. She had this like power over me and I really didn't like it. Nine days later, she came back and wrote even more comments, started arguing with more people. And that is the straw that broke the camel's back, I guess. It was one of those things that made me feel like, okay, no, this person is really trying to let out her frustrations on me and it's not okay. And that's one of the reasons why I posted it. When I went to my DMs, because I checked that I got a DM request and then I checked it and I was like, oh, she sent more messages. And I pressed on it. And I saw that long message and that was like, oh no, she really is trying to like intimidate me into thinking that I will never be able to work again in this industry. And at that moment, I really didn't care. I thought to myself like, nope, I'm not going to let anyone talk badly about us. And like, this is someone in, 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 in a high position. She's a senior head designer for Zara Women. And for me, it felt like, no, this person has a lot of influence, a lot of power. People really need to see what we as Palestinians also face and go through whenever we want to talk about Palestine. When she first sent the message, also one of the reasons why I ignored was because we're used to these messages that we keep getting. We're used to whenever something happens about Palestine, we're used to getting like Israeli trolls putting those like Israeli flags or like people just telling us a good Arab is a dead Arab and et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, okay, I want to ignore because... First of all, like, it's not going to take me anywhere if I reply to her and she might even actually use it against me. She sent you a message that was so long. I thought she was breaking up with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. like, what? Who, who sends a message like yeah. this? Listen, and, and the way that she kept changing with whenever she was uh, like, suddenly she, she switched and she started like supporting Palestine. And I felt like she's going to convert to Islam in one second. Yeah. You know, I was like, just to make it stop. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because yeah. 
there was something in the public reaction and the consciousness in this, you know, latest uprising where people were paying attention to anti-Palestinian comments, attitudes, and realizing, oh, maybe this is actually not a good idea. Maybe this is racist. Maybe these people are yeah. fighting a liberation struggle. Maybe they actually don't have rights and that's what this is all about. And she realized that she was on the wrong side. She realized it. She knew it in, in, inside. She, she never admitted it. She felt the public pressure. She felt public pressure yeah. after the reaction from the public. And that's the only reason she started to walk back. Because yeah. she was way too confident in her initial messages to you. Yeah. I felt a little bad for her when she said that someone is sending messages to threaten her children. Because first thing I was thinking was like, okay, the children in Gaza, a lot of kids died, a lot of kids suffered, and I would never want to put a mother in a situation where her, she would feel like her children are threatened. And like, she really, like, she, she sort of succeeded at doing that. Like, she knew how to pull the right strings. Part of me really felt like, okay, I need to delete this because I don't want someone to hurt her children, and I did. And I ended up, like, deleting it and saying that, like, you know what? She changed, but, like, no, she didn't. <laughs> she really didn't. Um, she had sent messages to people after and she had also continued arguing with them and like talking badly to them about the whole situation and I was like okay no no she's really like she was manipulating the situation so that yeah. she could get the result that she wanted because she realized that her barrage of messages towards you and her approach to outing you and arguing with people in your comments failed and so she needed to backtrack and she, that's kind of what she did with you and then she went right back to her old tricks i mean look i knew as soon as i read in her fake apology that oh i can't possibly be islamophobic because i have a muslim friend from morocco <laughs> come on i felt like she was talking about a maid i swear she, I a that a that but also yeah. like this is the whole i'm not racist my friend is black thing you know what i mean Hey, yeah. but it's a it's a pretty good one because the black person's from Africa at least. This <laughs> <laughs> I mean Zara has a long sordid history of deeply ingrained racist hiring and customer service practices. In a survey conducted by the Center for Popular Democracy, a racial, economic, and labor justice group, a random sample of 250 one out of Zara's 1,500 Manhattan employees participated in the survey and confided that Black customers are profiled as potential thieves seven times more frequently than white shoppers. The study, entitled Stitched with Prejudice, Zara USA's Corporate Culture of Favoritism, written by Shia Crowder, also revealed that Black customers were also more frequently denied exchanges and returns than white customers. Customers weren't the only people that were racially discriminated in Zara's stores. Black employees claimed that they were given dissatisfactory hour assignments and stricter surveillance from managers. It's kind of weird to me how they can make millions of dollars but are not able to pay people properly for their time, let alone give people the amount of time that they need in order to support their family, in order to keep a roof over their head, in order to, you know, just feed themselves, one employee said. Darker-skinned employees were less likely to be promoted to managing roles and were often given less prestigious roles. 68% of employees that were assigned roles in the back of the store and away from the public had darker complexions. Managers were generally white and generally gave preferential treatment to subordinates of those same racial ethnic groups. The extent to which Black employees were profiled in their work environment is alarming. Quote, one Black employee even detailed an instance in which he had come in in a hooded jacket to pick up his check. He was physically stopped as he was walking into the back office where checks are kept. The franchise was served with a $40 million lawsuit from a former worker citing discrimination unlawful discharge, retaliation, and a hostile work environment. 
the brand also received bad press last year for racist images on its merchandise, pajamas featuring swastikas, a necklace with blackface designs, shirts with gold stars resembling those worn by the Jewish people once held in concentration camps, and a shirt with the words printed, white is the new black. So Zara has a long history of being extremely problematic. I totally agree. And some of the things I really didn't even know before this whole thing occurred. One of the most important things is that when Vanessa was sending all those messages, she actually said that a huge part of her frustration came from people at the company that have been saying really terrible things about Jewish people. And for me, that caught my attention. And I was like, listen, there's no way when you talk about Palestine, when you're sitting with educated and people that are smart, that you're going to be anti-Semitic if you're really just talking about what's happening in Palestine, right? But it felt like there's something going on where people have been like talking badly about Jewish people there. She said that people at Zara were being anti-Semitic. I strongly doubt that. Yeah. Zara has done all those terrible things where they put stars and, and things like that. Sure that she was not experiencing people being anti-Semitic in her workplace. And this is how I know that because if there were people being anti-Semitic in her workplace, they would have been fired and Zara would have released a statement. Yeah. But because she is so comfortable being Islamophobic and anti-Palestinian, that leads me to believe that that's actually more the corporate culture that's allowed to perpetuate itself inside of Zara. I mean, whether or not, whether or not she was subject to that or whether or not she just said that, you know, in an attempt to excuse her horrific behavior, the truth is, is that her comments were extremely problematic towards you. And for Palestinians, exactly as you said, Qahad, for Palestinians or people who are interested in actually supporting the human rights struggle in Palestine, which is a rights-based struggle, you will never hear anything anti-Semitic from us because we're not motivated by anti-Semitism. We're motivated in this struggle to get our rights. It's just that simple. It's, it's about equal rights and it's about having rights on our land, rights that are currently accorded to one group of people, but not to us because we are not from the right religion, maybe, even though we've been on this land longer than many of these people have. So yeah. that's what this is about. It's not about anti-Semitism, hating people for the group that they belong to. We just want our rights. One of her tone deaf remarks to you was that, oh, it made her sad that you don't see eye to eye about politics. And I read that and I was like, well, how could you see eye to eye? She is supporting the status quo, which keeps Palestinians subjugated, an apartheid system. And you obviously would not be able to agree with her on that because that would imply supporting a system of governance that subjugates your own people and would leave you with less rights. So why on earth would you see eye to eye with your colonizer? It makes no sense. Very hard to see eye to eye when there is an illegal wall between you. For sure. It felt like she was trying to invent issues I have within myself. And it's something that's very common uh, with Zionists. After this whole Zara incident, an Israeli reached out to me and they were like, queer people do not exist in the West Bank. There was another incident where someone had told me there's no way that there's ethnic cleansing because Palestinians have been increasing in Israel and in the West Bank, which for me felt like, okay, you're living in a like illusion, you know, like you're making up things because you're just upset that something has been exposed. Also, those same people will never talk to you about the Palestinian population from 1947 to 1948, right? It dropped yeah. quite a bit. Yeah, obviously, they never calculate also the people in diaspora, right? If we really want to talk about why these people are in diaspora and living all over the world, it's literally because there was an ethnic cleansing and it still happens till this day. Hence why Palestinians are fighting for their rights. Like, it really just doesn't make sense. It just feels really cult-like. Some of them even believe that if they ever lose, they should all commit mass suicide. And for me, it's like, what the hell? Like, this isn't something that's religious. This isn't something that is uh, humane to yourselves, you know? I did not know that, but that would be convenient. Oh, yes, it's very true. There's a story of when the Romans started uh, during the, 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 the revolts. There is one story of a hero, a Jewish hero, who a lot of Zionists take pride in, 
And he's someone that was dragged by the Philistines. And, you know, they call us the Philistines sometimes. They're like, oh, right. you're the Philistines. We're taking your, uh, our revenge on you, you know? So, like, this is the way that they see it. And so it's a story that's very much revered by Zionists. And it's, like, deeply appreciated. And some of them either believe, like, we fight our death or we commit mass suicide. And for me, that's very problematic because it's not a vision that you need to have in order to, to make peace or, like, to really want to live with Palestinians in dignity and respect. It should not be controversial to live in a democratic society, a real one, where everybody gets a vote, where everybody's represented, where the distribution of resources is not determined according to which group of people you are a part of, where there isn't an illegal wall on occupied Palestinian land, where there aren't checkpoints for Palestinians and Jewish-only roads that let you drive by without passing at a checkpoint, where there aren't military assaults on Gaza every few years. That should be not really very controversial. And that doesn't deprive Israelis of their rights in any way. In fact, we've talked about it many times before on the Palestine pod. It actually frees them from being oppressors, which is kind of a good thing, right? Liberation of Palestinians means liberation of everybody, really, in this system of governance, which can only be characterized as apartheid. And that means liberation of Jewish Israelis and liberation of Palestinians. First and foremost, Palestinians, right, because they are the most oppressed in this tiered system of rights. But it also means liberation of Jewish Israelis from having to live with this, I mean, insane worldview. It, it truly is, Zionism truly is an insane worldview. And, and it's not sustainable, right? Because what they believe in when it comes down to it is that they should be allowed to live in this space free from Palestinians. But the problem is, is that there's Palestinians in Palestine, and there always is going to be Palestinians in Palestine. And so in order for them to carry out you know, their, their ideology and to perpetuate their ideology, they have to remove us. Ethnic cleansing is a necessary, central component of Zionism. And they will never be able to get rid of it. They will never be able to frame Zionism in this flowery, whimsical way that they try to, you know, they're trying to as of late. That's what it's all about when it comes down to it. And we are seeing it every single day in Silwan, in Sheikh Jarrah, in Beta, all over Palestine. These are just the recent examples. You know, if you know these names, that's just because you're paying attention right now. But if you've been paying attention for the last seven decades, every single Palestinian city or village has gone through this at some point. Yeah. Or will go through this if Zionism is allowed to perpetuate and continue. Even even some of their leaders, like Menachem Begin, have said like a massacre in Deir Yassin was very much needed for the creation of the Jewish state. And the word massacre was used. Like the word came out of their mouth. It doesn't even, we don't even have to say it. Like you can just go back into their history of Zionism and, and see really who, who the anti-Semites were. Like when you think of Herzl, they were really saying that um, they would talk badly about Jewish people and use like the word parasitic. And, this, and say that we need to create a new look for the for the Jewish people. And yeah, like they even said that anti-Semites would be their biggest ally. And like, you know, we're seeing it right now during these times. What caught the world's attention with this was that it's bigger just than this conversation between you and Vanessa, right? It really is representative of the problem of Zionism and the Palestinian struggle in and of itself. You know, this whole thing started with you literally sitting inside your room with a camera pointed towards the black water tanks on the Palestinian rooftops and showing like, look at the Palestinian buildings and houses and how shoddy they are. And look at this pile of garbage that's sitting in a Palestinian neighborhood. Israel will never remove this and we don't have any other way to get rid of garbage. But all the Israeli communities are taken care of. And you were showing just the disparities in daily life in Jerusalem, right? The city that's supposed to be for Israelis, you know, this uh, haven of coexistence, right? Depending on, you know, which politician is talking on which day. It depends, right? To receive a message like that that basically says you're lying. Well, what it, did you doctor the footage? I don't understand. I mean, what, what exactly are you lying about? It, yeah. it speaks for itself. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to read any reports. You don't have to interview any experts. You were, you were witnessing the situation and describing the actual reality that you have to live, what you have to go through to get water. Like, how is that a lie? That's actually what you must go through to get water. 
That's the part about this to me that I think is, is the most revealing of, of Zionism and the approach of the state of Israel to Palestinians. We are so dehumanized to the point where we're, when we actually just talk about the policies that are enacted against us, we're accused of lying, when it's literally how we must live. And she basically represented the position of the state of Israel and its propaganda sphere very well. She actually represented the surveillance state as well, because when she outed you, she held a long-standing tradition of Israeli intelligence of blackmailing and exploiting the LGBTQ community inside of Palestine. There is a unit yep. 8200 that tracks everyone's online digital presence, metadata, everything like that. And they will blackmail people to become spies or they will out them. Yeah, And that is the role that she played in your situation. Which is all the more interesting because Israel and its supporters try to paint itself as this haven for gay people, super LGBT friendly. Just go one kilometer south of Tel Aviv as a gay couple and see what's going to happen in occupied Palestine, like Bat Yam, whatever area, and you'll see how they'll treat gays. And this is like very, 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 very close to Tel Aviv. You'll go to Tel Aviv itself and just hear about the hate crimes that happens against gay people. One of the biggest actually hate crimes that happened against gay people was like a decade ago where someone came into an LGBTQ center and like shot people. The Orthodox community back in Jerusalem, they're some of the most homophobic people. They stabbed a girl uh, during the Jerusalem Pride Parade and that girl died. There's so many like examples that I could use. A lot of people that live in Tel Aviv are actually outcasts. They've been kicked out by their families. And they all live in Tel Aviv. And Tel Aviv represents sort of like this lost city. Like a lot of people go there for dreams. They never like, sort of like the, the Hollywood of, uh, of back home of Palestine. They, they go there, they want to achieve their dreams and they can't really do it because they're like the highest people are the European people, like the people that come from a European background. Then if you're Arab Jew, like you're probably going to be seen more of like a comedian or something. And then if you're like Palestinian, like, yeah, you're probably going to be like, a nobody, really. I mean, I, I, I lived in Tel Aviv. I lived there for a year and I've had someone spill a drink in my face for saying I was Palestinian. Tel Aviv is... It, I wish you could really call it liberal, but you can't. It's, uh, it's, a ve it's very much a facade, you know? It's just meant to make people think that like everything there is like cool, great democracy, yet like, te like 10 kilometers away, there's someone that's being shot or killed by the Israeli military. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah, gay people, when asked about the occupation, are like, I said I wanted a black male, not to be black male. <laughs> what the fuck? Michael. <laughs> that is a great <laughs> joke. That's a great is, joke. And I stand, I stand on that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Look, when we talk about pink washing, we're talking about an official Israeli government public relations campaign that attempts yeah. to exploit Israel's supposed LGBT friendliness, which we know is a lie and a facade. But they do this to promote perceptions that Israel is this modern democracy and, you know, this sunny tourist destination where gay couples can come from all over the world and just enjoy freedom in Tel Aviv. The Israeli government and supporters of apartheid Israel often claim that LGBT people have more freedom in Israel than in most places. They paint the state as this ideal place for queer couples to come and vacation without this fear of oppression. In August 2011, the Jerusalem Post reported that the foreign ministry was promoting gay Israel as a part of its campaign to counter the negative stereotypes that many liberal Americans and Europeans have of Israel. So it's, it's an attempt, essentially, to erase the effects of apartheid policies and occupation and siege, right? It would be a lot easier to just stop doing those things, you know, yeah. instead of coming up with all these campaigns to try to hide these atrocities but no they want to keep actually doing think that yeah. <laughs> I, I think it might be easier to just keep telling lies at this point they have very high rates of uh, violence against the trans community there one of my friends her name was maya she's palestinian and uh, her family obviously didn't accept her because you know like we obviously have problems in our society when it comes to 
to issues like that. But one of the biggest reasons why people behave this way towards trans people or, or gay people literally comes from the occupation. I mean, you have nothing to do. You're just sitting at home. You have nothing to do. You don't have a job. And like, obviously, who, who are you going to let out your frustrations on? People in your community that are going to be like the weakest or that are going to be a minority. And it always happens. We never talk about that when talking about what happens to queer people in, in Arab communities or Palestinian communities, right? But they never also talk about what happens to trans people. Maya was working in the street because nobody would take her for a job. She wanted to be a designer. She had a dream. She was extremely talented. I don't know how to tell you, like, this is someone that had worked so hard to try to, like, put her vision out there. And, like, she even went to a competition, Miss Trans International, where she could win a crown. and. She was working in the street to, to, you know, pay rent and everything. And then someone came and stabbed her and slashed her back. She survived it. And, you know, she got into a, a depression because I was also leaving. I was moving to Germany when some of the, these things were happening. So there wasn't really anyone near her except maybe me and another friend on the phone. And at the beginning of 2020, she committed suicide because she really couldn't take it anymore. There were two instances where she was stabbed. Someone in her apartment came and stabbed her as well. And this is something that a lot of trans people have to go through. A lot of Arab trans people have to go through living in Tel Aviv. You're literally seen as like some sort of fetish for being Arab. And it's disgusting. It's absolutely like disgusting. If uh, Also, like my issue is, is that they have like the trans community there that like defends the occupation and defends... What's, act what's going on, even though the, that same government is like not giving a damn when it comes to their own people being like cut up by, by like crazy murderers or like crazy criminals. Yeah, they will weaponize trans identity to support the occupation and to try and call out people who are making legitimate criticisms of Israeli apartheid. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, look, Palestinian society is like any society in the world. We all go through evolution and change and struggle with, you know, tradition versus modernity. These are big themes that the entire world is grappling with, right? This is not something that is unique to Palestine. And so for Zionists to say, oh, well, you know, you'd be cut up in Palestine or you'd be stoned to death in Palestine, you know, for being who you are, it's like, First of all, you're not addressing the issue. The issue is Israeli apartheid. Second of all, Palestinian society is a society that has been under occupation for 70 plus years. How do you want us to start going through all the different levels of you know, queer liberation and all of this stuff if we're literally being occupied? It, it, it doesn't work yeah. like that. There are certain basic levels of human rights that have to exist first before we have you know time and space and freedom to think about how else we want to evolve as a society. It just, you can't have one without the other. And the other needs to happen first. It's not going to happen, you know, in reverse. And so for them to try to justify apartheid by saying, oh, well, Palestinians are, you know, homophobic or whatever. First of all, check yourself, right? Yeah. And second of all, it's not, it, that, that, that's not an excuse for apartheid. It's just simply not an excuse for apartheid. The politics of any place are affected by the immediate environment, right? So if you were living under siege for the last 15 plus years, the politics of Berkeley might be a little different. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's very regressive because she just assumed someone's sexual orientation. And like, honestly, I've never written anywhere on my profile about my sexual orientation or anything like that. Like I never, because I also feel like, why should I talk about it? You know, I, 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 I will happily say I have the privilege to not really need to talk about it. And I, I'm, I'm confident in it. I don't need to talk about it. And also like, like, I, I don't believe in labels. I don't like labels for me personally. Like I'm someone that accepts if anyone wants to label themselves, but just don't label me. I'm who I am. First of all, I want to fight for Palestinian rights. And that's one of my goals. I obviously like want to fight for, for, for people that are discriminated against and minorities and everything like that. But for me, when it comes to how I label myself, like I'm Palestinian first and foremost and Muslim. 
you know, like this is something that's as well very important for me. But they always try to like really rid you and take away your identities or like put new different identities on yourself. Like, I don't have to believe in Western standards of what what's it like to be gay or be a homosexual or be uh, a lesbian or whatever it is. Like, we don't have to do it. We have our own culture. We're from the East. We have different ways of dealing with things. And we'll find a way to deal with it. We don't need your help because... The help that we've gotten hasn't been any help. They're fucking us over, you know? That was so beautifully said. Yeah, totally. When people say, oh, think of the gays in the Middle East, I hear white performative savior vibes. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I'm like, what are you yes. even talking about? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Funny thing is that they always want to talk about how we are regressive when it comes to gay rights and everything. But like, isn't part of the conversation that's happening in Western countries are if men are allowed to wear dresses? men where we came from were <laughs> things very similar were things very similar to uh, how women dress when it came to dishdasha you know yes. like things like that like twab and dishdasha are literally the same thing one is more decorative and the other is more colorful you know like it's literally the same thing yeah, this like, is so a- true this is what men have been wearing dresses in the middle east forever yeah. and also i find that heterosexual men in the middle east yeah, but also, this is another great point, which is that heterosexual men, Arab men, are much more comfortable with one another, showing affection to one another, than heterosexual men are in the West. Exactly. We kiss each other on the cheek. It's not unusual, right? One thing, one thing people that don't understand our culture, Arab culture, whatever, tell me is like, you guys have so many gay people. Why don't you just allow it? So many guys hold hands in the streets. I'm like, do you understand? Like being intimate with a guy doesn't necessarily mean that you're having sex. Men being nice to each other and like, you know, wrestling with each other, whatever it is, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean someone is gay. And that's also dangerous. One thing that Vanessa did was she assumed if I was like that. And who knows? There are guys that are feminine, that are straight. There are people that are masculine, that are gay. This whole thing of like gender expression does not tie in to sexual orientation exclusively. I actually know a thing or two about male intimacy because I wrestled in high school with homosexuality. (laughs) Where the hell sentence is going? I was like, Michael, please don't change the rating of this podcast. (laughs) I always came out on top, though. That is true. Uh, Oh, God. (laughs) It works though. It really, it's like a really good joke. <laughs> Wait, I'm using Thank you so this. much. <laughs> you know, do you, do you guys have to go through a lot of like censoring things because you're worried about people coming for you when it comes to things that are being said on the podcast? The way that we protect ourselves is by going through every episode and isolating every single claim that is made on the episode and finding a source to back that up and then posting a full yeah. bibliography of sources for every single episode that we've ever done. Perfect. And that for us is a protection, but it also is a resource for our listeners you know, who are able then to get further educated on these issues and on these themes that we cover. And the fact of the matter is, is we try to stay crystal clear on the facts and the commentary is really just interpreting what the facts themselves are show or, or or say and you know we we we're not trying to exaggerate anything that's that's the that's the crazy thing yeah. about all of this is that we're not exaggerating we are talking about a group of people that has rights and another group of people that just doesn't have rights and they're in the same place and that's yeah. really what this boils down to and so we can find israeli sources american sources international sources palestinian sources to support everything that we say because we're not making anything up yeah, and we're literally just talking about a failed project of theirs that they've used to fuck up our lives. Really, like, it's super important to talk about it. Like, everyone really thinks that the creation of Israel, like, is, like, something that is, like, definite, you know, or, like, something that, that just means that for the rest of our lives we have to deal with it, when the reality is, like, the project has already failed. When it comes to Palestine, they really weren't able to get rid of us, and that's why their project really could never succeed because leaving us had also showed a lot of people from their side that like, hey, there's something twisted as well going on, which is why their society keeps fighting with each other. You know, like the right doesn't agree with the with the left. Whereas for Palestine, whether you'd find Fatah or Hamas, like the people that support these two different things, or like forget about people that support any of these movements, just literal like people that are like me and you that are like living back in Palestine, right? 
they're all united on one thing. We don't want the occupation. We just want our rights. Yeah, I think it's, I, I mean, it's a good point that you make, which is that the other settler colonial projects were able to exterminate local indigenous populations to a greater extent. The majority of the people in the U.S., in Canada, are settlers, right? So it's also a myth to say that indigenous people don't exist anymore. They certainly do, yeah. right? With Palestine, they always talk about the demographic threat. They talk about the fact that we are going to outnumber them and that we are already almost, you know, equal in number to them, right? And that's a problem because that means that they will never be able to fully actualize the Zionist project because then you end up in a situation of apartheid, a minority ruling over a majority and depriving that majority of rights. And apartheid is an unsustainable system of governance. So they are in a very difficult position. And that's why they work so hard to resist the label of apartheid. No, 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 it's not apartheid. You just don't understand. You need, you know, 45 PhDs before you can begin to even understand what's going on. It's very complicated. It's been happening for 5,000 years. Well, no, it hasn't. It's been happening for just over seven decades. And it's not that complicated. You're absolutely right that the project has already failed. And it's really only a matter of time before liberation. We talk about it all the time. Yeah, exactly. There was a certain energy that, Palestinians really felt while this whole thing was going on sort of like this energy that was like coming out of nowhere you know yeah two years ago I came back home and I visited the country and I was thinking to myself oh my god everyone feels so stressed everyone looks depressed you know people are fighting with each other a neighbor would fight with his other neighbor for like a car parking spot or things like that and I was like what's going on and so when this happened seeing everyone from different parts of Palestine whether they were queer whether they were wearing a hijab, not wearing a hijab, like all people from like conserv- conservative people to liberals to, to queer people just sitting all together and like protesting. And, um, you know, it was something that's, it's beautiful because like we were able to do it while we we're under occupation and they are never able to do it while they're the ones that are in power. You know? That's amazing. And that's so true. I mean, we've talked about how one of the most incredible aspects of this uprising was seeing the unity even from within Palestine and then in the refugee camps all across the Arab world and then in exile more broadly everybody was united against the apartheid state and everybody everybody was united in the struggle for rights it's just that simple you don't even need to be a part of a specific political party because at the end of the day the goal is is one which is to get our rights and I, I really hope that we can sustain that energy and and keep it going, right? Because what would be really unfortunate is to see that this is just sort of a moment in time that slips yeah. and then, you know, we go back to... Inshallah, it won't be, but because I really also notice how people are, like, they're getting much more educated on, like, word usage, like words yeah. like occupation, apartheid, ethnic cleansing, yes. things like that. Like, people have been definitely using it and like even people that aren't fluent in english you know like they you hear them saying things like apartheid which means ethnic cleansing in arabic yeah. also like the fact that people now just pull up their phones as soon as anything happens they just pull up their phones because they know that like hey listen we we have this as an advantage if they're really doing anything to us we can just pull up the phone rec- record their crimes and it's not like we haven't recorded the crimes. They've been recorded for long, long, long time, but they were coming out as documentaries. And documentaries have a hard time with censorship, etc. even though we're facing censorship when it comes to Instagram or whatever. But no, we're kind of still able to find new ways to break the algorithm. It really causes a shitstorm for their PR. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Which I'm so happy about because like we were so stressed. Like, you know, like for long, for really, really, really for long, whenever we, whenever we talk about Palestine, whenever we talk about what's going on back home, people really either like don't want to listen because they're like, ah, this is happening. This has been happening for too long or whatever. Or people uh, tell us, oh, but like Hamas or whatever. Mm-hmm. And now, like if anyone mentions it, like you definitely know this person is like unstable. You don't need them <laughs> in your life. <laughs> right. Palestine is really like a very good indicator of like where this person stands. It's not only clear, but like it, it affects every part of the world. And so like when you think of Palestine, you can't help but think of also like African liberation. You can't help yourself but think of like indigenous people, 
how uh, in the, the Middle East is used for its oil for so many different topics. It's so interesting to me because one of the main strategies of the occupation is divide and conquer, right? Creating a tiered system where Palestinians have different rights, different access, etc. But the structures of oppression are so heavy that it brought unity throughout, right? Yeah, yeah. Their strategy didn't even work. They're so heavy handed in their divide and conquer. They brought people together. When people say, oh, but Hamas, that has to do with the media coverage, right? And everybody knows the media coverage has been disproportionately in favor of Zionism, so much so that over 500 journalists, including reporters from the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and LA Times, signed a letter calling on media to stop obscuring oppression of Palestinians. An open letter on US media coverage on Palestine also demanded an end to, quote, this decades-long journalistic malpractice, signed by 514 journalists. They said, finding truth and holding the powerful to account are core principles of journalism. Yet, for decades, our news industry has abandoned those values in coverage of Israel and Palestine. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, even Vice changed the way they reported on Palestine, which was like, uh, okay, I'm liking this, you know? Like, because before they'd be like, oh, like, look at the settler in the West Bank that's having a hard time because, like, she came from, like, a different part of the world. And I'm like, oh, my God, like, what about that one living in a refugee camp in, like, Jordan or, like, in Syria or in any other place? Like, why don't you go and report on that instead? In a way, yeah, obviously, it's a win when it comes to um, how some certain types of medias have been re reporting on Palestine. But you could also see that they've ha they have a lot of uh, pressure on them when it comes to really talking about radical things, you know. Even though I like the word radical, but nowadays it's used for like to describe something negative rather than like actually something that could bring a better change for everyone else. Also, on the subject of access to media, Belal Mohammed is a UFC fighter. He defeated Damian Maya at UFC 263. And he was the only fighter on the main card who was not given a post fight interview in the cage. And that is because I would, I would think WME owns the UFC. Many executives from WME are a part of that group of entertainment executives who were deeply disappointed after Lord canceled her show in uh, the occupation. So anyways, if you'd never see me on TV, you know why. <laughs> Being in the fashion industry yeah. as a Palestinian and mm -hmm. you're, you know, you said you're newer, you're up and coming, you're a fresh face. Do you, I mean, you've obviously come forward and said, you know, don't be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid to tell our stories. I mean, that's kind of the quote that has been circulating in the media ever yeah. since this incident with uh, Vanessa. So do you feel now that, you know, I mean, how, how are you, how are you navigating this? Are you feeling perhaps that maybe you're going to miss some opportunities that you would not have missed? I want to say that like one of the most encouraging things and like, supporting things that anyone could do is talk about Palestine, especially when they're a big celebrity, right? Someone like Bella Hadid, someone who has a huge amount of following and she's like, she's, she's established in the industry. She works really hard. See her talk about Palestine. It even pushed me to talk about Palestine as well, because it made me feel like, okay, the hero is talking about Palestine. Let's talk about Palestine as well. You know, like if they're if they're not going to hire me for a job, then it's going to be indicative of their anti-Palestinianism. Right. I've had moments where I as someone asked me, are you Palestinian, like a casting director? And I said, yes. And they gasped and not in a good way. Like and I was like, is it a good thing or a bad thing? And she's like, it could be good. And I was like, uh, I'm not going to get this job. You know, another casting director was very happy to see me, saw my card. And everything is like, where are you from? And I was like. Palestine and he's like okay next like wow. he literally did this so this like there there is an anti-arab sentiment when it comes to some clients 
and there's people are afraid to work with Palestinians because they're afraid of the media. They're afraid of maybe being like banned or something like blackmailed. You, you never know, really. That's why for me, it was like seeing the Hadiths talk about it so much. I was like, okay, like it's, it's, it's great that they're doing this and it's pushing a lot of people that are also in positions that I'm in to like talk about it. The whole industry, there's only like, I'm literally the only Palestinian model that has been working in the industry in Europe or in the US. I'm the only one. Like I've never met another Palestinian model. I've never... I've only met another two Arab models that are, one of them is directly from the Middle East. The other was raised in France, but is Tunisian. Tunis, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like all in all, we, you could say that there's like seven Arab models and we're really like a few. Like I, I know that I'm the only Palestinian aside from like Hadiths, but yeah, it's, uh, there's a huge talk in the industry of diversity or whatever. I'm not sure if I'm confident that this diversity will happen when it comes to Palestinians, because I also know that like there's a lot of influence in the industry. Personally, I don't know if I'll actually ever be working again or like be booking like uh, other big jobs like uh, John Paul Gaultier, even though they were the most supportive. They like they're the best brand out there, I think, personally, one of the best ones that like really stood behind me and everything. Time will tell. And regardless, like. Yeah, there are really no regrets. Like, there is no regrets. Like, I really feel like this is the right thing to do. And there is no way I could have lived with myself if I did not expose Vanessa, if I did not talk about Palestine, and that if I did not show support for my own people. In Arabic, we say, if you don't have goodness for, uh, like, for, for your people, you don't have goodness for others, you know? How can I expect myself to be someone who is going to succeed in this industry if I'm not someone that is going to speak out over the right things. And I, it felt like it's super important to take this stand against such bigotry because I've also witnessed so much anti-Palestinianism while working that I felt like, you know what? Screw it, you know? Like, why, why are we afraid? It's, it's, it's nonsense that we just have to sit and watch while our rights are being taken away from us as we are being portrayed as terrorists and to be silenced because someone is going to shout and pull out the anti-Semitic or the Holocaust card. Because for me, it just, like, I will happily sit down with someone and explain to them how much I know about the Holocaust, how much I really read about these things, because I care, you know, about people that have been hurt in the past, because it's also a topic that is, is important for today. But when someone starts to harness it and, and use it against, against us in order to try to really hide the crimes that are happening to us, that to me is like, Sorry, I will point it out. I'm Palestinian. I will fight for Palestine. And there is no regrets, really. No regrets about it. I really appreciate you saying that. And I want to say as a Jew that it's, it's important to know what happened in the Holocaust, certainly. But you should not feel like you have to prove your knowledge of the Holocaust because you're Palestinian right? It's not like Palestinians woke up and decided they wanted to be oppressed by Jews. Nobody gets to put in a request form for their oppressor, right? And the fact that people continue to connect the atrocities of the Holocaust in any way to Palestine does a disservice to the memories of the people who perished in the Holocaust. Because- yeah. The Holocaust does not justify apartheid. The Holocaust does not justify ethnic cleansing. The Zionist regime must stop making the Palestinians pay for the crimes of Europeans. During the Holocaust, there was an economic agreement between the Zionist regime and the Nazi government. Avara agreement. It establishes economic ties that allowed some Jews to transfer funds from Germany into Palestine. They also had a coin that they shared. You, you know, the, the Zionists love to show you the coin from 2000 years ago, the ancient Judean coin, but they never want to show you the Nazi coin. Yeah. <laughs> also, they whenever they talk about this thing about like, they need to live in Palestine because, like, this was the land like 2,000 years ago. Like, 
I think it's very problematic to say that. Like, how do we like a lot of a lot of people can't really trace the roots back a few generations. You know, like, how do you expect to say that you're from there 2000 years ago? Besides, like, there was Judaism, then Christianity came. So a lot of Jews became Christian and there was Islam. So a lot of these two became Muslim. So like the question of the children of Israel, when God talks about the children of Israel is not directly talking to just Jewish people. It's talking about those people. We would be the children of Israel today. Yep. You know? Like, that's the thing. Like, they, 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 that's where the supremacy really comes in. Like, if you're really someone who's educated, you'd understand that, like, you know, this is a region that connects Europe, Asia to Africa. So obviously it's going to be really mixed. I traced back, like, my, my DNA or whatever. It's like the genes. Did you do the 23 and me? Yes. Okay. What does your results show? It showed me that I'm West Asian, which means that I'm from Iran or like Mm -hmm. Iraq which makes sense because my mom is from Iraq. It also showed me that I'm Middle Eastern, North African, Italian, Greek, and 1.8% Nigerian. I had Greek too. And I said, this is because the Greeks were in Palestine. I don't have anyone in my yeah. family that's from Greece. Yeah. yeah I had 12% yeah. Greek. Yeah. It's, it's the thing is like people, people forget that Palestine, even though there was the, the Jewish revolts against the Romans, but like really Palestine did not have ethnic cleansing throughout history as much as other regions did in the Middle East. And they tried to paint us as like the, the, the people that are not indigenous, you know, like we are the settlers to try to create an indigenous feeling for them, you know, they'll be like, Hey, Y'all are Arab colonizers from the seventh century. Also, my grandma moved here from Poland. <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, the yeah. Fuck? <laughs> They'd be like, hey, y'all need to forget what happened in 1948. Also, we're reclaiming our land from thousands of years ago. <laughs> oh, it's so crazy. The it's logic. Crazy. The logic. One of the things that they do is they tell people in Jerusalem if you go, like, if you're a woman that's pregnant, some of these women go to Jerusalem hospitals and they're told, to uh, get rid of their baby, to abort their baby, because the baby is going to come out deformed. And especially if, if, she's, if the woman is pregnant with a male, this is one of the things that they do to people. And there's a popular influencer on, uh, on Instagram. His name is Ahmad. And he spoke about his sister was one of those people who went to a hospital and they said that her ch- child was deformed, that she needs to abort it. And it was a boy. And then she went to an Arab doctor that was not belonging to the Israeli health system. She went to an, to an Arab doctor and the Arab doctor said, no, your child is fine. Like he has no issues. And it's a way to really control uh, the population in Palestine. It's an open secret that this is what they're going to do. And this, like, it was an open secret that they're trying to destroy Al-Aqsa, right? For us. Now it's out into the world and it's like, oh, look what they're actually teaching children about Al-Aqsa, et cetera, et cetera. This topic is one of those topics that's like an open secret in Palestinian society in Jerusalem. But it doesn't get any attention. It really doesn't. Just the other day, settlers were escorted by the IOF into the Al-Aqsa compound, and they were joined by a representative of the Israeli government. So illegal settlers tramping around Al-Aqsa compound, you know, just short of one month after an assault on one of the holiest sites in Islam. They believe that the temple should be erected there because this would bring the coming of the Messiah. It's very much as well supported by the evangelicals that really want to see this happening so that Messiah could come. You know, I don't know, like, what Messiah is going to come out of, like, capitalism? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Explain this to me, you know? (laughs) That is um, so true. Jesus loved the money changers. That's how I read the Bible. <laughs> no, Jesus was like, like, this is one of the things that were pissing off Jesus, according to the Bible. And a lot of these people actually, they don't understand Judaism. Like, they really don't understand it. I don't know what book they're reading. They're straight mainlining Zionism. It's a direct needle. Yeah. It's, it, I don't know why people don't say that, like, the, like, like Zionism is is like religious radicalism, if you think about it. Like, why don't people talk about that? Or like how really it's it's the reason they, they fund Wahhabism. They fund so many different things around the world that cause terrorism. Yeah, we talked about how... We tried to, and then our video got deleted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. We tried to, yeah. 
it's a lot of censorship. It's really crazy. I don't have any other questions, but I do wish you the best of luck in your modeling career. And I hope to see you on runways and in magazines every season yeah. here on out. I, I really do hope that inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> this was only a moment that allowed you to see who your allies really are and will just lead to greater collaborations rooted in authenticity and true allyship. Inshallah, inshallah. Like I said, Palestine is the soul of the world. And if people sooner or later don't realize that, then it will really be too late because everything that they test out on us, they will test out on you. People who are truly active in Palestinian liberation circles know that there is no liberation without queer liberation, right? There is no free Palestine without the freedom of sexuality. Yeah. The there is like, when it comes to every single uh, type of people, like uh, uh, Palestine is, um, is a very good example to be used of how like you can be queer and Palestinian and still be discriminated against. You could be this and Palestinian and be discriminated against. You could be Arab and, you know, like it's, it's a very good uh, example to pinpoint on different struggles around the world. And queer liberators have been the cornerstone of liberation in the United States as well, right? We can think of Stonewall, we can think of Martha P. Johnson, the trans community specifically, and the LGBTQ community at large have always been and will always be on the front lines and leaders of the movement. Yeah. But we need to also really, like, the reason why we need to fight that against pinkwashing is because they really harness people's emotions. Uh, people's feeling of alienation and, and isolation uh, to try to make them support Israel more, support in a way the American agenda more. Uh, we need to fight against it. The pinkwashing happens in the United States too, right? Joe Biden is like, now oh, yeah. trans people can serve in the military. Wait, it's what? like, great. I'm sure the people who are dropping bombs are like, are they trans or not? <laughs> <laughs> It's so have you seen that? It was like a lady. It was it was like a Latina woman or something or a black woman. It was like I'm black and oh my god, no, we don't want we don't want queer people killing us. Like it'll it'll hurt. I am black, queer, and I love the destabilization of different countries. (laughs) Tahar, thank you so much for coming on the Palestine pod. We so appreciate your time, your stories, your perspective. Thank you so much to our listeners for listening to another episode of the Palestine Pod. You can find all of our sources within a few days up on our website, www.palestinepod.com. You should follow us on Instagram at the Palestine Pod. And if you want to send us an email, go ahead and reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. That has been another episode of the Palestine Pod. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah, it's a fan. Um, Sorry, Kahid, you're gonna have to. <laughs> I'm gonna have to sweat it you're out. Go- you're going <laughs> glisten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's gonna. <laughs> the Palestine pot is yeah, supposed great. to be an enjoyable stop experience now, for our guests. Yeah, but... we gonna put you in the hot seat, <laughs> <laughs> literally. <laughs> food benders and, and this whole thing going on with food benders i've been right. i've been pulling up yeah. in person to support her yeah it's crazy uh, please if you see her tell her like Fahir gives you a huge hug and Aww. like okay. like kiss her on yeah. the cheeks for yeah, me yeah. really like like mm-hmm. Ajad, it's one yeah, of the, the things that really is like we say in arabic basa which means it's like a middle finger you know it's like mm-hmm. someone that has really worked hard and like just did nothing just posted something about gaza and yeah. since then, her life has turned into an absolute nightmare. Yeah. It's actually, it's interesting how things have changed for her as a result of the Intifada of Global Unity, because people started showing popular support for Palestine. And the people who had been longtime supporters sort of felt like this lift of weight that had been upon them, yeah. right? It was sort of like, now collectively everybody was at least a- acknowledging that what they were doing was right and yeah. uh, she actually she i was at the protest with her she's getting so much love and she got a full Aww. like ovation from the crowd after being introduced by an activist a palestinian activist and so it's just Whoa. like she's finally getting her flowers and she absolutely deserves them
Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We've never had keeping that in for sure. I'm keeping that in. We haven't 100%. had one of those yet. 